Hello, and welcome to Christian Life Assembly of God Church. Enjoy this teaching from our Sunday morning service. We focus today on the fact that uh, suffering is not an end in itself. Uh, many times we uh, are caught in the middle of some difficult period and we think this is all that there is. And uh, the Apostle used the example of a woman in childbirth. She, he says that when a woman is in childbirth, you know, it kind of consumes her, the pain, the difficulty of that. But once the child has come, that that is all forgotten. And it's the same way for suffering in our lives here, that we are consumed by the difficulties that we are in, but the time comes when that is past, and uh, we find ourselves in a different place. In Job chapter 19, Job begins to cry out. He feels that uh, his friends have ill-used him, and uh, he makes some strident uh, rebukes of them that they are being unfair, and even if uh, they were being fair, they're not being uh, kind or, or good to him. Uh, and then he expands it. He says, you know, I am in such bad straits right now that even little children won't listen to me. He says, my very servants, he said, I call out to a maidservant, and she doesn't recognize me. He says, I speak to my servant, and he won't respond to me. He says, my wife finds my breath is noxious. Job goes on and he says, even God has hedged me in. God has taken my family and my friends away from me. God has taken my brothers far from me. I am alone. I'm suffering. I'm in difficulty. And you just feel his, his pain. And, and those of us that have experienced suffering in our lives, we we empathize with that. This is not a individual experience of Job alone. This is the experience that all people have that go through suffering. When people come up to you and say, I know what you're going through, they have no idea what they're talking about because your suffering is your own. Uh, it, I still think it was incredible of Job's friends that they came and they for seven days sat in silence, just sat with him while he was in pain and grief. We all internally feel things differently than others. We have our personal experience. But one thing that seems to be universal is we seem to boil it down to the experience of the moment. The past is gone, it's behind us, and the future is not yet come, and so we live in the moment. And there's some truth that the moment is what is real, but the moment is not what's going to be forever. And the past can be an aid to us to remember that we've gone through hard things before and we've transcended them. And sometimes people do get caught in the past. They, they can't let things go. They've experienced the pain or an injury of some kind and they hold on to it and it becomes the center point of their life. But I just want to say, suffering is not all that there is to life. And one of the issues that we have dealt with over and over again is the question of why. In this, the first three sessions of the book of Job, that was really the driving force is why is all this going on and in Job, it's easy for you to say, well, it's all part of a, a play or a short story. And behind the scenes, these things are going. We, we know what's happening. It's like uh, people have difficulty in portraying uh, mysteries sometimes because they want to give you a little bit of a, a hint beyond what the characters know, but they don't want you to know the whole story. And uh, God has given us a lot more than just a hint. He's given us some pretty solid, substantial reason why Job's in the situation. But when we cut over to Job, Job has no idea. Job is clueless. Job is uh, like a boat that's out in the ocean without a rudder, without a sail, that is just being cast from one place to another. And Job doesn't know what the next 
uh, ill use is coming. Job is like a dog that has been mistreated by his, his master and he's been beaten and kicked and uh, when the, the, a person walks into the room he flinches because he's afraid of what's going to come next. And you think this is the end for Job. Job's wife has already counseled him to essentially commit suicide, curse God and die so that it would be over. But at this point, Job reaches in somewhere inside of himself and he finds a strength that is unanticipated and he says some of the most powerful words in the entire Bible. And I'm going to read those right now. As you get into the second half of the uh, 19th chapter of the book of Job, he says, Oh, that my words were written. Oh, that they were inscribed in a book. And you're thinking, oh, he just wants a recounting of all the depressing things that have gone on in his life, right? As for me, I know that my Redeemer lives. And kind of shock comes into my life at this point in the story. Because in the Jewish system, a Redeemer was someone that would come and buy you out of slavery, someone that would buy you out of debt, someone that would uh, use their resources to, to free you in a, a society that was not only in, internally but externally all of the societies that surrounded it w had slavery as a, as a way of life. A redeemer was someone that would come and would set you free from, uh, from slavery, that would take you out of that, that would liberate you. And he's saying, here I am in the midst of pain and difficulty and I have no idea what's going on. And yet in the midst of this, I know that my redeemer lives. And not only do I know that, but I wish that I had a, a, a stylus that was made out of metal, like a, a nail, and I could scratch it in a sheet of lead so that there would be a permanence to it that would transcend uh, papyrus, that would transcend vellum, that would transcend paper, that would transcend any sort of normal writing thing, that it would be inscribed like some sort of a monument forever. I know that my Redeemer lives, and at the last he will take his stand on the earth. Even after my skin is destroyed, yet from my flesh, I shall see God. Now you can take this two ways. One is you can say, well, he's talking about the, the resurrection. He's going to be resurrected after he's dead, and his body is corrupted, and his skin is wasted away. And uh, at that point, he will see God. And that, that's a legitimate theological position. But I want to suggest to you one that might even be more radical than that. Job was suffering from uh, boils and cysts, and he was, he was puncturing them, and he was letting the, 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 the poisons out with a piece of uh, sharp pottery, and he was setting on an uh, ash heap. And in the midst of that, his skin is actually disintegrating off of his body from these boils. And he's saying, like a person that has been through a, a third-degree burn where, where the skin is actually consumed and taken away. As I'm laying here dying with my last breath, I believe that I will see God. Whichever way that you want to interpret that, there is no doubt that there is an absolute confidence in Job that no matter what happens to him physically, God will be triumphant and God is his Redeemer. Whom I myself shall behold and whom mine eyes will see and not another. In other words, I'm not talking about that I'm going to leave offspring, that I'm going to leave a family, that I'm going to leave somebody else who's going to see God and know God. I'm going to know God myself. And he says, my heart faints within me. If you say, how shall we persecute him? And what pretext for a case can we find against him? Then be afraid of the sword for yourselves. For wrath brings the punishment of the sword, so that you may know there is judgment. And he, he declares, there is judgment. And he's confident in it. He, he's saying, hey, you folks out there who think that because I'm down, I'm out, I've lost my wealth, I've lost my power, I've lost my position, I've lost my family, that I'm vulnerable and you can take advantage of me at this point. He said, just consider, there's judgment coming. And I'm not afraid of it. I want to challenge you today that you are people who are going to suffer. There is no doubt about it that all of us will suffer in this life. In fact, the Bible says 
All who will live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. It says that Jesus Christ learned obedience through suffering. Suffering is part of the human condition. We live in a fallen world with fallen people, and oftentimes those that are the closest to us injure us the most. That being said, we can take one of two courses. We can either collapse under the weight of it, and the book of Galatians talks about the fact that we as a church need to support those people who cannot bear the burden that they're under. It, 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 in a short passage, it goes from, uh, it says that uh, what we, we should bear, each person needs to bear their own burden. And in another place it says we should bear one another's burdens. When it says that we're supposed to bear one another's burdens, the word that used shifts from, in the first one, being a word that represents a backpack or a load that would be normally carried by a soldier or a worker to the word that would be used for the load that would be put on a ship. When you feel like that you're under the ship and you're being crushed, that's when the church is supposed to come around you and help lift it off. But even if you find yourself in a situation where there is nobody that is stepping forward, the church is not holding its responsibility, uh, your family is not doing its responsibility, all of your friends have abandoned you, and you feel the weight of all of your troubles coming down upon you. Cry out, I know my Redeemer lives. In other words, God has not forgotten me in this place. God may be uh, working with me, God may be involved in this situation, God may be uh, distant from me in the fact that I can't feel him. Jesus cried out, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Yet in the midst of that, God has not disappeared from the earth. And we know that our Redeemer lives, that there is one who comes in. Now I want to talk about what Dr. Uh, Rosevere said. We not only go through suffering, and I often meet people who are uh, quick to enumerate all of the things, the difficulties, the problems that they are uh, suffering in their life, the, the, the uh, grief that they have, that they have gone through, the, the difficulty, the hard time. And in the midst of it, they almost revel in it. They tell me, oh, this is a problem, that's a problem. Uh, my nature, and uh, to, to a different extent, in a different way, uh, the nature of my wife, we, we uh, attempt to solve problems. We try to uh, reconcile difficulties. We try to pull people out of the fire. And yet we find oftentimes people don't want to be helped out. They just want to vent. They just want to tell us. They just want to say, oh, life's horrible. And they want us to agree with them, oh, life's horrible. I have a friend whose parents passed away about a month ago, and every day he sends me a, a song on YouTube, the same song over and over again, and then all of a sudden he, he he opened up on me and he said, "Oh, you don't care, you're not interested, whatever." Well, I've been sending him songs back too. I thought maybe this is the way that he wanted to communicate. I tried to text him and there was no response, so I've been sending him songs of hope and encouragement and uh, trying to help him in his time of grief. But I responded quite lightly. Yes, I, I'm concerned about you. I want. That I think you need help. I think you need people around you. And then he started sending me the songs again on YouTube. So I, every day I can watch the same song on YouTube. We need to consider our lives. I can't fix my friend's life, but I can certainly do things about my life. Each one of us needs to look internally in our life and say, I recognize that there's difficulty, hardship, and suffering in my life. We are not denying that. A person has a child die, a spouse pass away, uh, they're in a bad accident, they, they lose their ability to walk, they, uh, they right now a lot of people are, uh, they're saying 20% of American workforce is going to be out of, out of work. A lot of people are without jobs, they don't know how they're going to pay their bills. Uh, their children go through difficulties and situations that they wish that they could control, but they can't. You have all these opportunities, and then your body fails you. You know, you get sick from some disease or hardship or arthritis or whatever. Something happens to you, and you, you, you have problems in your life. We all are going to have problems in our life. We can't control what other people do, but we can do things about what we do. 
Dr. Roosevelt talked about the fact that she was beyond praying. I think the Christians often are reluctant to say that they've ever gotten to the point where they're beyond praying. But where they're in suffering, where they're crying at God, why, my God, my God, why have thou forsaken me? Instead, they want to put on this, this plastic Jesus face and, and pretend like everything's swell and then they blow out and do some unthinkable sin or, or stop going to church or become an atheist or whatever because they've never been honest to start with. And so I, I want to challenge you to really grapple with this situation. We see Job's situation. We see Job's response to the situation, right? And you go, well, man, Job's a better man than I am. But I, I, I just want to give you a, a, a couple of thoughts on this. The first is, is that, that if we know why suffering occurs, it's easier for us to go through it. When Dr. Rosevear understood that the suffering that she was incurring was the outrage of mankind against a loving and benevolent God, but that they had rebelled against Him and that they were lashing out against Him, and that she was the object of God that they could see. She was Jesus before the watching world, and when they beat her, they were beating Jesus. All of a sudden she says, I can help fulfill this, fill up what's lacking in the sufferings of Christ. That's what the scripture says. Another place where, where I mentioned before, it said that uh, Jesus for the joy set before him. Jesus went through the passion and suffered horribly. He, he literally died of a broken heart. His heart tore itself apart. Uh, he, he literally fell down because of, uh, uh, of blood loss. He, was, he suffered physically incredibly. And yet, it says for the joy set before him, because he could see beyond that, that this is not all that there is. When you get caught up and you say that this pain I'm in today is the worst thing that's ever happened and it will never stop, it leads you to despair and lack of hope. But when you say to yourself, this too will pass, I'm going to go through this, I'm going to press on, I'm going to, uh, there's something on the other side. And something good can come out of this. You know, the Bible says all things work together for good to them that love God and are called according to His purpose. Not all things are good. Not all things work together for good. But when we give ourselves up to God, something good can come out of that. Job, in, in his suffering, if nothing was left but his response, I know that my Redeemer lives, that would be enough. That has brought so much consolation and support to people throughout the centuries, the millennia. For thousands of years, people have recounted this story and said, you know, when I pause and think about it, the same God that created the universe is going to bring judgment on the universe. Things are going to come to where the accounts are going to be squared. And God is not going to forget what I've done or the relationship that I've had or even I as an individual. It, it says in the Bible that precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. And in another place it says that he collects all the tears that we have into a jar. God is fixated on you as an individual. He's standing with you. Your Redeemer lives. Jesus said that there's not a sparrow that falls from the sky or a hair that falls off of our head, but that God is taking account of that. How much more valuable are you than a sparrow? So to recap, Job suffered greatly, felt abandoned, had suffered in reality and had suffered in relationally with the, the people that were around him. His response to that was to fixate on what was real and fundamental, that his Redeemer lived, that God had not abandoned him. We need to be people who pause, even in our suffering, and who cry out, I know that my Redeemer lives. I may not understand everything that's going on, but I believe that God can use what I'm going through for some good, and there can be purpose. There can be purpose to it. There may not be purpose to it, but there can be purpose to it. 
Because God's bigger than my problem, than my suffering, than my difficulty. When we look out and we see other people, and we see the way that they're abusing us, it helps us if we pause and we, we look at them and we say, you know, I've been in the situation that person's been in. Stephen, the first martyr, echoed the words of Jesus on the cross. Forgive them, for they know not what they do. We need to be people that are, that are in charge of our lives. Not just victims, not just passive, not just letting it go. But taking charge of our life. And pressing beyond the endurance of suffering. To the, to the fact that we find meaning and value. And perhaps even joy in our suffering. Pray that God would work in your hearts. Because I know a lot of you are hurting out there. And God can help you. If you'll cry out, I know my Redeemer lives. The very same God that spins things in orbit.